Welcome. Uh, what I'd like to do now in the brief period I've got is to talk about a different form of example to what we've just heard. It's in the public health or the, or the public health space rather than a commercial space, although obviously all of these things interdigitate uh, and come together, hopefully in a sensible solution. So what I'd like to describe is the journey from 1.0 to 3.0, which I alluded to this morning in my presentation. So let's, let's begin, because this was a journey we've been on since about 2.15 was the first concept. So let's begin with 1.0. That was 2.15 to 2.19. The problem was this. We had unmet demand. We had lots of residential aged care or RACF patients. Well, well in fact, they're not patients. They're residents with geriatric medical input into care plans, there was only 5% of them who had input into their care plan in, in across the Loddon Mallee region of Victoria, which is about 25% uh, with the humour edge and a little bit more. There was a two to three month wait for a geriatrician outpatient review. There was a decline in GPs wanting to visit residential aged care facilities. This was the problem to be, to be addressed. So we went out to the communities all of those health services you see listed on the left there, smaller health services, to say if they had to have their, you know, their best first choices, what would their priorities be for increased services of any specialty? And we can see where geriatrician services scored. They were first priority in the great majority of uh, those health services, which varied from having inpatient beds of five up to 50 or more. So we thought, well, we're not providing that service. We then set about, well, we now got the feedback from all these individual places on this map of the Loddon Mallee region of Victoria. We'd identified the gaps in the services of, in terms of provision. What were the initial steps we undertook to answer that gap? Well, we got the input from local communities. As I said, what did they want? How did they want it delivered? And what could we best provide to meet their needs? We then set up service hubs and referral pathways and linkages to clinical governance structures, and then also explored possible funding sources. And to do that, we created a subacute services forum across the region. So in other words, the beginnings of a hub and spoke model in 2016-17. The solution we were trying to create was a self-sustaining specialist ver geriatrician virtual outreach uh, assessment service which was really having as its goal increased equity and at least maintenance of quality of care, if not improvement of quality of care, and that being provided to older adults across regional Victoria, but in the first instance, predominantly in residential aged care, which had very little input up until that point in our region. So we started with a goal of 15 residential aged care services across the Loddon Mallee region to provide services to them, and indeed, we started with one and then five of these RACFs to begin with, getting the technological side of the equation worked out. So what was our overall scheme or initial vision? The vision was this, a telehealth-enabled shared platform using as its basis a common telehealth home monitoring and health informatics analytics enabling platform, starting where we saw the greatest need that was unmet, which was in residential care, and in smaller hospitals across the region. And in terms of that, we found we got a Better Care Victoria Kickstart grant to fund that proposition. And then subsequently, having started that proposition in 2016-17, we actually applied for the support for a Kickstart to the other side of the equation, that which was providing Jerry Connect services at home providing chronic disease and pandemic management, or at least monitoring at home, aged care support, and potential for dementia diagnosis and or support with services at home. But that wasn't seen to be a fundable proposition when we put that application after we'd already been given the residential in-reach proposition of a geriatric assessment service or a comprehensive assessment service. How things change as COVID came along thereafter when this wasn't seen to be fundable uh, in 2017, but became terribly necessary in 2020, 21 and 22. So the next phase, this stage two or 2.0, was the Loddon Mallee virtual care planning we'd done to prepare for 2020 to 2022. So therein, 
we go to what were we needing to establish before we started Jerry Connect 1.0? Well, we need to understand the market, the clinical uh, reality. We need to know what workforce was required, what the resource was. We needed to look at recurrent funding sources because it's all well and good to start with kickstart funding. But was it sustainable as a service model in terms of financially sustainable or resource sustainable? And did it have the ability to dynamically grow? Finally, and least, least importantly of all of those, did we have the technology base upon which we could establish this or what would be the most stable technology base on which to grow and evolve that technology base whilst we grew the service? Those were the basic pillars that we felt were necessary before we began. So we spent actually a year thinking about those things before even starting a service. Because what we really wanted to establish was having gotten the kickstart funding from Better Care Victoria, that we had a financially sustainable proposition that was also scalable eventually. And indeed, what we did then was to do modelling, the business modelling, which showed according to that business modelling that the clinical need in terms of the hours of consultation we needed to provide to, uh, to address those issues what they were and therefore what the resource was from a clinician point of view, but also what was the likely time frame? and these are months along this x-axis, what was the time frame at which we would break even in terms of the cost of providing that service versus the revenue stream that we could generate with it, and it was around six or seven months. So we needed enough money to get to break even. What were the risks? Well, some of them are listed down this left-hand side of the equation that GPs wouldn't refer, that not all the regional health services want to participate, that we just weren't able to recruit, that residential care staff didn't support the program, or that the MBS items for telehealth no longer funded or were reduced. Well, that's a current concern right now because they seem to change even without any form of warning. And finally, would there be poor technology acceptance, both at the user end as well as at the clinician end, especially clinicians who'd never performed a telehealth assessment previously? So what did we end up delivering uh, at March 2020? Well, we started with that scope of delivering to 15 regional public health service residential care facilities. What we actually ended up with was this. We ended up with over 60, and in fact, 62 at the moment, residential care facilities supported. We have over 200 GPs referring, in fact, now up to 250. We do more than 1,000 consultations per year on average, both new and reviews. And we've changed our whole model of care to the regional places around us in Bendigo, uh, which is our core facility, uh, because we used to deliver about 5% um, of those via telehealth back in 2015. And now those to the region are 75% delivered by telehealth uh, rather than the converse. We thought we'd better look in 2020 at how we'd been going in the first three, four years of our operation. So we commissioned an external evaluation from the Centre for Online Health in Queensland at Queensland University. And they provided that external uh, unbiased view of how they felt we'd been going. And there were many lessons from that. And there's a published paper in the Journal of Telecare uh, and Telemedicine, which I refer you to, you can go and look it up, um, which actually gave a short form version paper related to that report. But some of the take home messages. The first were there were challenges. There were varied training needs and, in, and we needed to increase varying levels of telehealth confidence and skills within the residential care facilities within the smaller health services. We were very reliant in our business model on the continued telehealth MBS funding that could come from individual consultation. So that was a challenge to make sure that we didn't, uh, shall we say, fall in a heap in terms of our sustainability. And in fact, we'd already uh, pre pre-shadowed that incentive uh, that was built into the original telehealth MBS funding items are going by modelling the fact of what would happen if that disappeared and could we sustain? And the answer was yes. We also needed to have effective communication between stakeholder groups, particularly with regard to the local involvement 
with referring GPs or other health professionals. This was a key. So champions within each of the facilities, relationships with the GP and GP practices that were in, in that uh, sphere of inference, and also continually revisiting all of their needs, the stakeholder needs, whilst assessing our business development. As I said, the success factor was having a champion both within each of the hub and spoke centres, but also champions within our own team who could go out and sell and connect and continue to connect to the individual sites. But we also need an administrative core, and in fact, we used a nurse liaison position to keep the workflows optimal for both our end in terms of the provision of service, but also at the other end in terms of the user acceptance, the user uh, usability factors, and also the relationships with those referring and caring for individuals at the other end. So at that point, around 2019, 2020, we were talking about in Bendigo, what's next? What's, what's next in our further development of virtual care outreach service? And we gave a concept presentation, Jackie Plunkett and I, in March 12, 2019, about what might be next. In other words, what might Jerry Connect 2.0 look like? So this is what Jerry Connect 2.0 and at least the developments thereof uh, look like over that period up until this year. We started to focus on this left-hand side of the diagram, the at-home side of Jerry Connect. And could we get up home monitoring propositions uh, and also look at what was the best way to do that for individuals in the community? But I'd like to just pause about something that was mentioned earlier and say that our focus was really like the NHS at the moment to look at could we do so by not only dealing with individuals, but then somehow bring that data and the strength of that data or the organisational structure of how we provide the service to a population level so that we're not just, if you like, influencing one individual at a time, but using the collective reality of that to influence a greater population. A very important proposition in terms of how, what the units of intervention as well as the focus of intervention might be. So back to Jerry Connect 2.0. So I can just give you in this brief time a small view of a few of the projects that we did to try and build on what might be the infrastructure going forward. So we went through these projects. So we'd set up the Jerry Connect Telehealth Geriatric Medicine Comprehensive Geriatric Assessment Service already that I've already outlined by video conferencing. We then wanted to implement a means of actually monitoring people in terms of their vital signs for chronic disease, particularly during the pandemic, for both the needs of COVID monitoring at home, but also for those who didn't really want to come to a hospital anymore, but had chronic diseases that were being undermanaged because of their relative lack of contact with both their general practices as well as with uh, specialist physician services. And that was in consultation with a company called NetHealth Data. We then looked at, well, for those who don't have a mobile phone, because this was a mobile-based app, and I'll come back to all of these in just a moment, how would we reach them if they didn't have a phone or had poor connectivity or they had poor internet connectivity? Well, that's when we started a project, a regional project related to aged care services, where we used an IoT platform, we did the things platform to try and reach these people in consultation and collaboration with La Trobe University. Finally, I'll mention another a monitoring at home or monitoring in the hospital solution that we were engaged with and have just, uh, fin well, still continuing to use, but uh, have some exciting announcements with respect to. Uh, we joined a company called Anexa Medical who'd produced a sensing surface of the mattress of the bed, whether it be at home or in residential care for those relatively immobile, uh, at risk of pressure ulcers, or whether it be an ICU or in our subacute wards, also at higher risk. And finally, with all these things evolving to try and provide an outreach service, did we have the workforce that could sustain going out to someone's home and teaching them how to use their home monitoring devices and how to connect? Or did we have people up front who could triage small questions related to home monitoring or home performance of tasks, or even whether people are relying on uh, programs that are virtual to do their rehabilitation or other things at home. So we'll come to talk about the role of digital virtual care assistants 
as well. So I'll just touch on each of these in turn very briefly. The first was to reach out to people, particularly firstly with Siemens platform and then with a NetHealth data ecosystem platform to monitor people in the home. We've now finished a year or so ago a trial where we monitored people with chronic disease who were receiving uh, care in the community via community nursing via this platform, which is based on a mobile health app solution. Why did we choose it over others when we put out an EOI? It's because largely it also had this on the left. It already, like few others, integrated with the general practice software, Medical Director Best Practice, so that immediately once the data was collected at home, was available to the clinician, be they in the hospital with consent of the client involved, or be they in their general practice when that person went to visit, uh, and it was part of the usual workflows and the usual software that those two entities were using. Terribly important, as well as uh, having all the availability of various types of devices, no matter whether someone had diabetes, chronic airways disease, heart failure, hypertension, or other of these problems to monitor at home. So that was one solution to be trialled. The second was this, that we wanted to support people in the community who didn't have this connection, or was there a cheaper way also for those who didn't have the resource to provide that equity of access, uh, people who couldn't afford a mobile phone, didn't have a mobile phone, or couldn't get connection in far away Bandawallop. So we, with La Trobe University, joined up, and they had devised a relay unit, like a little box that's only about 10 centimetres long, uh, to actually sit in the home and be Bluetooth to peripheral devices like the ones I've just mentioned, to then transmit via the LoRaWAN community IoT networks that exist, particularly in regional areas increasingly. But if it didn't detect that sort of connection, it would look for a Telstra Cat M1 IoT connection, uh, or in the future, we can actually send this via satellite if none of those obtain and you're in the middle of Udnadatta or the middle of uh, Uluru uh, or near Uluru, you're not on Uluru, uh, to actually uh, provide that connection to send the data that you might be uh, generating from your home. And then we challenged ourselves to have that end-to-end -end data security, but also to bring that record into a dashboard which could be viewed alongside and with electronic and medical records at the central zone where we were monitoring these things at Bendigo Health, but could also be seen by those in general practice wanting to see the same results. So that's been a project we've just reported on back to the funders, Regional Digital Victoria. And then the, the third of the prospects we've been uh, investigating, this was patients, particularly since I'm a geriatrician, who develop potential for pressure ulcers that we want to prevent and we don't have enough people, particularly at nights in residential care facilities or even in hospitals, to adequately monitor whether they're starting to develop these things or not. So this company has developed essentially an integrated smart sheet that's integrated into the surface of the mattress, uh, which senses uh, the person lying on it or sitting on it. And then with a fairly sophisticated background with that sensor data, of algorithms behind it and adding patient risk factors and machine learning, then delivers uh, a display to the clinician or in fact to the individual at home or in residential care to tell them about whether they're developing any areas on their body which are at risk of pressure injury. Now, this solution obviously can be used in acute care and long-term care or even in home care for those who are relatively immobile or even in the chair of someone with a spinal injury, for instance. Most importantly, not only can they detect pressure, but within a period of a small number of years or even maybe less, uh, we'll not only be also measuring pressure to avoid pressure ulcers, but it can all, these sensors can also potentially monitor sleep, breathing rate, whether someone's on or off the bed, weight, heart rate, whether they've been continent or not, et cetera. It's, it's a multi-potential proposition. Just to give you an idea of what some of these images look like, this is with someone during the night monitored in the trial that we've been doing for seven months at Bendigo Hospital and also at St. Vincent's in Melbourne, uh, gathering now about 12,000 hours of observational data uh, and being able to detect not only 
where or how the person's lying just from the data collected with a greater than 95% accuracy, but also then to take that forward to how that might apply to the clinician or to particularly to the nurse who might be looking after that individual patient or resident. In other words, does it stimulate action? And so it comes back to the dashboard and says to you, well, there's a red zone there. We think you need to turn that person or relieve the pressure from that area on that part of their body because that's going into a zone that looks like it may be at risk. So that's some of the applications we have there. But finally, do we have all the labour force that we need if we're going to actually get into this era of home monitoring and home solutions? And this was simply one take from an, a, a VC angel saying that the virtual care assistant era is uh, exploding in 2020, and we all see that coming. How do all these things coalesce so magically, potentially, into a future vision of where Jerry Connect 3.0 might go by, say, 2024? Well, at home, we need to embed in the community these sorts of propositions for home monitoring, whether it be NetHealth or another variety of home monitoring solution, another variety of the IoT monitoring of vital signs of home environment sensor monitoring to support people at home. But my fervent reality, as per the last two speakers, is that it's not going to be health service directed entirely, but simply data connected, generated within the community, embedded within the community, but able to be visualised in terms of the data via a health service or via a general practice or via a community centre with the consent, of course, of the individual or a carer of theirs. Do we need to monitor people in other ways at home? Yes, we do. And now we have the ability with a finger prick to look at bio biological markers of disease or wellness. They're collected at home, transmitted to a laboratory, and online you have a result tracking you over time. Even more apparently futuristic, but no, it's a real thing now. You can have this little box on the wall generating radio waves that actually performs tasks looking at recording what your heart rate is, what your blood pressure is, what you are doing a sleep study, not connected to any wires or ECGs or electrodes to the head. Oh, no, disconnected, doing the same task. And I'm just going to drop forward, and this I'll just say one word about this drop biohealth. What they're pioneering in terms of that monitoring of biomarkers is a longitudinal digital approach to personalise direct access to the knowledge and insight that might inform people and empower the individual to take care, to take self-responsibility and management as they can, for those who can, of their health. But going back to this from wearables to invisibles, the emerald box is one example, um, this can actually provide vital signs monitoring just by interrogating the waves of the radio waves that sends and are reflected back to the box it can actually do these things right now. But even more remarkably, if we look at the right-hand panel, this on the, in the green is what a sleep study looks like in terms of stages to sleep, the recordings. Well, if you look to compare what's coming from the box without connecting anything to someone's body, therefore getting a proper sleep perhaps, rather than a disturbed sleep with being connected to 20 wires, um, it looks remarkably similar. Do we want to track people and where they are in their home and how active they are with Parkinson's disease? Well, we can, and there it is. I, I would explain it, but it's just take my word for it. We can actually derive whether their gait is changing, their gait pattern, whether they're walking as much, what rooms they're occupying, are they moving out of their beds, are they going out of the house, have they opened the fridge, all these things. But who's going to be watching and who's going to be helping these people with all these digital innovations that we've got? Will we need these virtual care assistants? Very clever ones, I might add, as I'm experimenting with a company called Soul Machines. They basically not only are simple avatars, but also able to detect emotion and respond to that. Are you anxious today? I'm sorry to hear that, but can we talk about that? And perhaps I'll help you with how you apply your oximeter to measure your blood oxygen today. And then the patient can see that result on the device there, whether it be a phone or a laptop or, a, or an iPad. That's education. Will initial triaging be done when someone's unwell like this? We'll hand over back to the clinician to do the actual assessment uh, or the formal assessment be started with this. 
Will some of the data connected by these virtual care assistants actually provide diagnostic clues, for instance, to someone's cognitive performance or speech patterns or facial changes in terms of the patterns of their presentation to say, no, they're in pain today. No, they're anxious today. No, they're cognitively not as sharp as they were at the last consultation and they're not using the the keypad on the device they're using as effectively. Let's test their cognition. So finally, uh, how we deliver home telehealth in terms of clinician assessments. Well, at the centre, Kit Huckvale and and a group of us have actually been experimenting with this simulation of optimising how we do telehealth with the potential patient there, the doctor there, but actually having these home monitoring solutions, whether it be by remote patient monitoring, by IoT sensing, by an emerald box, by an exa medical bed surface, or drop by health biomarkers, bring them all in at the time of the consultation, visualise them. And if someone's in front of you, can you bring their result immediately in to inform that clinical assessment? Yes, you can potentially. Point of care testing, right there and then. Can we access their EMR from the hospital right there and then? Can we bring their online questionnaires they filled in whilst they've been waiting in the virtual waiting room? Yes, we can. So take home messages, then I'll finish. Uh, Always look on the bright side, as Lunig would say. We need to not only do service model innovation and technical digital innovation, actually one of the critical most important things is to do business model innovation. We need to underpin with some mechanism, the funding of what we want to deliver in the community or find a mechanism for doing so, whether it be shared reality with government support or a user pays model or some blended model in between. We need to work that all out so we've got interoperable data and accepted service models that are ready to adopt, but particularly to scale. If we need to play with these things to see how they work or don't work very quickly in short term, we can use the Centre's Digital Health Lintron which Wendy's talked about earlier this morning. But I hate to look back to 2009 when I put up this slide to launch Len Gray's uh, Research Academic uh, Centre in Queensland. And all these elements I wanted to bring together, that's what I thought were the elements we needed to have. And have we gotten there in the last 13 years? Not quite yet. Have we brought the patient into the centre? Maybe. Listen to my talk from this morning. More importantly, have we got the Commonwealth policy framework and funding to optimise both access and quality of care? Not really yet in place. And that's 13 years later. Well, we've got an aged care commission that says we need to do something. We've got the government response. How they connected? Interestingly, we should talk about that. Which is the way we should go? Well, we should all get together, be it commercial, academic, institutional, research, on the ground, in the community carers, we should get together with those who use the services we're trying to provide to optimise health and wellbeing, to join with all of us together to make it a better reality for us all. And on that, I'll end. Thanks.